Now, um, uh, forgive me for, for stumbling over the word, a, a word that I actually suffer from, which is synesthesia. And I think I'm pronouncing it uh, correctly. Um, I honestly believed everybody I knew, uh, you know, all human beings saw days and numbers in colours. And I was quite shocked when one night on this radio station, somebody phoned up and went, no, Joe, it, you know, I don't. And most people don't. But there is a word for us that do. And I am so pleased to say, not only am I going to talk to somebody who also um, experiences the same thing, but she has written about it and placed a character into a novel. And this is a mother from Canvas who, uh, Kansas who has sensory cross wiring. Um, anyway, it's all the uh, storyline of a novel called Rapeseed and the author is Nancy Friend and she joins me on the afternoon show. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you. Um, so, okay, then what colour is number eight? I don't have a number eight colour. I, oh. I'm well. What you'll realize when you study synesthesia is every single person is different, right? And um, I, in fact, I'm going to really disappoint you and tell you that my days of the week I only have one of them with a color, and that's Thursday, which is yellow. Mine's pink. Ah. Why? So why? This is a silly question because when people ask me, oh, why? Why then is you know eight orange? I have no idea. No, I don't know why Thursday's pink. You know, when people say is, uh, Monday is blue and it's nothing to do with it being a sad day, it just happens to be blue. Right? Why is only one of your days coloured? I have no idea, and I have no idea why. the The main part of synesthesia that exists for me, which is also true of my uh, fictional character Carol Ann, is memory and color association. So for Carol Ann, I gave her the full gamut of synesthetic um, experience. So she sees all her letters and numbers and color, and she has uh, phantom smells that come in when she sees certain colors. Do you have the smell thing too? No. Uh, my son calls that smallucination. Smallucination. Yeah, which and is like, great. Can we just say what's happened to you in a food hall today? Because yeah. Because you went into a major well-known department store's I did. food hall. And just explain what happened. It, it was actually, I walked right in just to kill some time on the way here. With the tube strike, I was worried about how long it would take to get here. So I had some time and I walked in, not to the food hall, but to the um, like junior's department of right. a big store. And it's because it was juniors, of course, they were playing loud music and there were, um, you know, clothes in every bright color in front of me. And it was visual chaos and it was very noisy. And immediately I responded negatively to it. It was too much sensory overload. And I walked in, immediately turned around and walked back out. And what I realized was that my response to it felt like a bad adrenaline rush, right. which is what low blood sugar feels like right. for me. Yes, of course. And yeah. I'm also diabetic. So I went to check it and I had no other symptoms of low blood sugar until that moment that I walked into the store. Are you type one diabetic? Yeah. Gosh, I'm, I'm pulling my chair in. I could talk about this for hours. Mm. Do you think they could be linked? I, my, my I absolutely think is. so. Really? I really do. I think that what the brain is doing and what you I mean, you've been talking about food today and how what we do to our bodies by what we eat. I think it's um, I think it's absolutely linked. And I just am eager for the neurologists and the endocrinologists to get together and figure it all out. It's so, coming. <laughs> and yes, this is so interesting because do you think, I mean, this whole thing about juicing and, and smoothies and everything else, and people, I mean, they say to us, eat, I mean, I'm, I read somewhere, in fact, it might have been Kate who was in earlier, um, brightly coloured food is very good for you. I'm a big believer in that, yeah. And that would that would make sense of everything else you've been talking about in a way, actually, mm. that, it, that colour plays a massive importance yeah. in our lives. Yes. You know, and what we choose, what we, well, obviously danger and red and all the, but, you know, what we choose to put into our bodies yeah. as well. Um, so I feel I'm lacking in my um, uh, uh, my syndrome compared to you because mine is just so basic. No, is, but you have you have the true definition. So you could go to any of the synesthesia labs that exist in the world, and many of them are here in the UK, right. which is so exciting um and they would be happy to welcome you in and do all kinds of cool stuff with you right well and some of my listeners because when i was taught it was like i'm spartacus i'm spartacus people come <laughs> right. phoning up going and me this it's, is happening to me it's the coolest thing isn't it yeah right stay with us um i'm speaking to nancy friend i uh, will also give you all the details of this book the book is fascinating and to, for her to incorporate all of this into a character makes it even more interesting we'll talk about that and the storyline of it in a moment but first of all as i say um there is a real uh, a tube strike on today, so let's catch up with the travel and Fiona. 
Starting with the tubes, the Waterloo and City Line has uh, no service all day today. All other lines have a form of service, but longer gaps between trains and many, many stations are closed for the full list, as I could take most of Joe's show up if I listed them all. Uh, see the BBC London website or the TfL website or Twitter feeds. Uh, Northern, Jubilee and Victoria lines are the three lines that are running to their length, but again with station closures. Circle line running between Hammersmith and Aldgate, Hammersmith and City between Edgware Road and Barking, Metropolitan between Harrow on the Hill and Aldgate and between Uxbridge and Harrow on the Hill. Bakerloo is running between Queen's Park and Elephant and Castle. Piccadilly line running between Hammersmith and Heathrow Terminals 123 and between Arnus Grove and Cockfosters. District line running between Ealing Broadway and High Street Kensington and between Wimbledon and Upminster. Central line running uh, between Epping and Leightonstone, between Hainault and Marble Arch, between Ealing Broadway and White City and between West Ryslip and North Acton. No service on Heathrow Connect between Paddington and Heathrow because of separate industrial action that also means a reduced service on the Heathrow Express. Uh, I'll give you a full roads update at half past, but uh, just to let you know, rush hour has started early. Very busy out there on the usual routes. Louise Pepper, BBC London, 94.9. Next update, 4.30. Thank you, Lou. I called you Fiona, but That's thank you, That's all right. BBC London, 94.9. London's news. London's stories. Weekday afternoons from 3. Joe Good. Getting loads of emails in already talking about uh, the subject that Nancy Friend and I are talking about. It's, uh, it forms a, a basis of her book, really, but we'll say in what way in just a moment. And this is uh, synesthesia, which is seeing days in colour, seeing things in colour and, 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 and colour playing a major importance in memory and all the rest. And thank you for all of you who are emailing me in. I'll read some of these out to Nancy in a moment if I have time. But Nancy, let's talk about rapeseed because this uh, there are, this novel interests me on so many levels because you yourself live in Switzerland I do and the, the book is about a family and it's the relevance of families I can talk about families forever because mm. I always say I'm not a very good family member but the relevance of families and families moving from one base to another mm. and the fallout in between just explain the scenario of your book. Yeah, that was exactly what I wanted to explore with with this one was sort of how these people have come. It's a trio. It's a it's a husband, a wife, and a teenage boy, and they've moved to Greater London from Kansas. Um, I happened to have moved to Surrey from Kansas City myself, so I had some experience. Um, but that's about where the fiction um, starts and the reality stops. That I'm, it's I'm not the main character, but because they finally shed the constraints of their hometown and their upbringing and the people in this small community that expected certain things of them, they really um, started to open up to new experience and new definitions of themselves. And that's really what the book aims to get at. And there's a lot of um, secrecy, isn't there? Or mm -hmm. lies, should I say, of mm -hmm. people keep or lies or people keeping stuff back from each other. Explain that. Yeah, it's funny. I think I feel like the word lies is a little too strong. And maybe falsehoods is is a little bit more correct, but fact is, it's when people keep things to themselves um, within a community or even to themselves in their own mind, um, it does come down to basically being a lie. Um, with rapeseed, there is a it, what it kind of is is a main uh, character, the protagonist Carol Ann, who's the synesthete, coming into an acceptance of herself. She's someone who has grown up knowing that she's unusual because she had, um, as a little girl, many of the symptoms of synesthesia that her twin sister did not share. And her twin sister was sort of the favored child from the beginning. So um, it didn't take long before Carol Ann was mocked and felt different and uncomfortable in her community, especially in her school, et cetera. So she learned to hide uh, her unique talents and abilities. A lot of synesthetes, I'm sure you experience it too, consider it a real talent and a, and a gift. Um, there, I don't know if you saw that article in The Guardian that came out on Saturday about it, but they no, did a fantastic I can't report. Believe all this. It's like when you hear a word, you keep hearing it I know. again and when, again. There's I'm, some German phrase for that, which my son, again, always reminds me. It's like Meyer Baden Meyerhoff. I don't know. But it means once you've heard something, it keeps coming. So that's totally true. But so this article on um, Saturday talks about how they may be able to train non-synesthetes to, to replicate what synesthetes do, especially right. with color recognition and letters, right. in order to maintain brain cognition, especially as people are aging. 
So it, really cool research. And most of it's being done in the UK and the Netherlands. Um, also, there's a synesthesia lab in Houston where they're doing a lot of wow. important work. And do you say there's a lab here or you don't know of one there, here? No, there are, I brought the article for you. I'll show it to you. You can, <laughs> you can see that. And for all of but, you listening who say, yes, and me and me and me, well, I'll, I'll read that out later mm. um, uh, when Nancy's gone. Um, and so and I also want to explore the role of, um, of family as well in mm. this because uh, next week we're actually going to be talking to an author who has written about a family... Uh, upping sticks and moving somewhere else mm. that happened to me as a child we i was hauled back and forth from australia back here all the time and it does it does a strange thing to a family actually it allows you space to have secrets and everything because you're mm. you're being uprooted all the time from what is normal mm. Do you know what I mean? so you can get away with an awful lot yeah and and you can really redefine yourself according to plan which most people will never have that opportunity you could go by a different name i've got friends in switzerland who uh I have one friend who grew up as Peggy, and today she's Margaret. Mm. And, you know, people do that when they go to university, of course, and whenever there's a natural transition in your life. But to have a whole family encounter the possibility at the same time, it's a uh, little unusual. You're, you're talking on a London radio station, which is very interesting because London is a landmark in, in this book as well. Mm. And talking of landmarks, what do you use as landmarks and how did you decide to make it local to London? I mean, what, what, because you weren't living here at the time of writing uh, when it. I, when I started writing it, I was oh, living here. Yeah, and, and my husband is British and so my initial expat experience was always to and fro Greater London. So this was definitely my sort of mental home base in terms of anything worldly. And um, just the, the I like the um, uh, the story behind why you actually called it rapeseed, mm. because especially this time of year. Yeah, because um, if you travel outside London, the orbital, you'll see these massive, brightly coloured fields, which I don't think farmers like, but all of us love because mm. it's just like patchwork. And that it that occurred to you when you were with your husband driving. Is that right? That's right. That was yeah. That was the uh, the initial moment when. Um, I think all writers uh, are asked the question, what made you write this? Or was there a pinpoint moment for you that made you realize this is the novel I want to write? And most people don't know how to answer it. But in my case, unusually for this novel, I did have that moment. And it was when I was in a coach and we were going with the American Women of Surrey <laughs> Antiques Discovery Group off to Woburn Abbey. And this coach rounded a corner and it was primarily filled with Americans and they all saw this rapeseed field and, and they were all saying, what is that? Is it mustard? Is it marigold? And what, what could that possibly be? And uh, I'm married to a Brit. So I'd been through that experience myself with my mother-in-law in the car originally. And when I said all those same things, what is that mustard? Is it marigold? She said, no, 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 that's the color of rape. Which is quite an interesting phrase. Isn't it just, yes. And so when I answered all those American gals the same way, I realized there's the novel I'm going to write next. Yes. Um, uh... Uh, right now, I'm gonna I'm bombarding this at you, Nancy, so you can help me through this. Loads of people emailing um, cool. to do with the subject, but let's before we go any further, talk about where you can get the book. The book is called Rapeseed. Mm. Um, my guest is called Nancy Friend, and it's spelt in the German Freund, yeah. so it's F R E U N D. Rapeseed is the book. I love these velvety covers. Mm. I love it. And the publisher is Gobro Press. Gobro. Press, mm -hmm. so you can buy it online. You can buy it in bookshops. Yeah, you. It, the easiest way to get it is Amazon. Um, I don't know of any bookshops in London that have it in stock right now. So Amazon's the easiest way. Okay. Um, otherwise, you'd have to go to the states or to Switzerland to get right. it. In a shop, so, so buy online, and it's mm -hmm. called Rapeseed Nancy Friend, spelled E U N D. This is from Julia. Uh, Joe and Nancy, I absolutely love your show so much. Um, mind you, it's bucketing down where I am at the moment, which is in Sussex. Good Lord. Mm. My son connected the alphabet to colours from when he first started to read. So A was skin coloured, B was red, C was pale green and so on. We were absolutely amazed when he came out with this, but it was at the age of five. However, he's grown out of it. Mm. Have you heard of that before? I wonder if he's truly grown out of it or if he just says he has but what i've heard is that they believe all babies are born with it oh really and that as our brains develop we outgrow it so in his case maybe that's exactly what happened as he outgrew it a little later than most babies who do outgrow it earlier maybe or say. maybe it's the way we're taught or maybe if you're taught the alphabet on a page with a color at school and it's well they they say synesthetes that it that it sticks that if you have it and you believe a is skin colored then you'll believe it 
all your life. Once you, if you admit to yourself, this color is uh, a match for this letter, then right. it should stick with you. Right. So interesting that he outgrew it. Yes, isn't it? This is from Kathy, who's listening in Waterloo. Uh, Joe and Nancy, yes, I also d- see days of the week, letters of the alphabet and most numbers in colours. I had always assumed this was to do with primary school when teachers would write mm. on coloured card on the classroom wall. So I will be interested to hear if your guest thinks this is so. I don't think it is, actually, because no. I, I, there are so many influences, aren't there, since you've been learning colours, mm-hmm. you, since numbers at school, you wouldn't have thought it would stick with it, would you? No, and um, that's that's always the first question to, of any synesthete. They say that uh, it may be as much as 4.5% of the population that has classic synesthesia, but uh, the question first and foremost is, is that colour association introduced, or is it intrinsic, and did you did you invent it in your own brain, or, or did it come in through colored cards in school or that sort of thing. And uh, the neuroscience behind it says absolutely it came from the person. Really? It's not introduced. Nancy, this is going to blow your mind. This is from um, a listener in Israel, Yarden, who is totally blind. Mm. And she says, I also have synesthesia. I don't see days or numbers in colors, but I have colors for people's voices. Yes. Also texture to people's voices. Did you know that a lot of blind people are synesthetic? I didn't know that a lot of blind people are, but I've absolutely heard about voice and color association. That's one of the things that I sometimes do. Really? Yeah. Explain that. It's, it's, I think it's a, a quality of vibration. I really don't, I can't explain it. All I can say is that some people's voices, I, when I hear them speak, whether I've seen them or not, there may be an introduced color in my mind. How interesting. Often it, blues and browns for voice. Blues whereas, and browns for voice. Uh, Yard and be very quick. Blues and browns for voice? I would love to know. <laughs> Let us know. Just because we've almost run out of time, but I just mm. very quickly, because I think the book will appeal to a lot of people on all, lots and lots of different le- uh, uh, levels. Also, um, very much to women who are uh, dealing with husband, mm-hmm. teenage son thing. <laughs> and, and That's what the book is. Well, it, it is, isn't it? Mm. And, I, you know, I've never had children. And I often say say, oh my goodness, I just see these children ripping my friend's relationships apart. Mm. But hopefully then it's all put back together again. Yes. And I think it's, it, you know, without summarising too much, that is very much part of the plot, isn't it? Absolutely it is. Um, the 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 conflict in the family comes from outside, outside sources and from within. But uh, in my world, everything should end up happy. And if, if I write the book, then I get to do it that way. Um, I think really what what we all often learn is that we already have access to what we're searching for. And that's kind of what I tried to do with the plot of Rapeseed. It doesn't mean that everything ends up happy because that wouldn't be true to even to fiction land. But um, yeah, I think what we're see- seeking in life often is already there. We just have to be open to it. Nancy, before you go, will you quickly stick the headphones on? I just want to take a call whilst you're here. Let's where, go to where the, are they? should be down or oh, my producer's oh, going to come in. Yeah, that's it. Can you hear me through them? Is yeah. Right? Lovely. Let's go to uh, Bromley. Pete is on the line. Hello, Pete. Hi, Joe. Hello. Um, right, speak very, very quickly, good. Nancy, to, uh, to Nancy <laughs> and I, very quickly. Yeah, when I get with my band and we do rehearsals, um, they say G flat or E or F sharp. I see colours. That's normal. <laughs> so normal. he's a synesthetic. Well, yeah. you're a synesthetic. You... Well, I just wondered if that was what I was. Um, yes, you I've are. I've always seen it. Um, we get by that way. I never learned how to read music or anything, but if they are talking in their musical terms and waffling off into their their language, I see I see a colour and that's all I see. Yeah, there's a, there's a lab in Houston where uh, they have a site online called Synesthesia Battery, and you can actually um, listen to tones with uh, musical notes and, and looking at vibration and click numbers to see where you stand on their... On their Pete, list. You must do it. Go on, go I'm online. Gobsmacked. I'm gobsmacked. Absolutely gobsmacked. You Thank see, you. it's like when it's it's like when I discovered there was a term for what I do. It's amazing. <laughs> Just give us the the um that uh, one website. Is, uh, synesthesiabattery.org. Go on, Pete. Right. Get, go will. on, and you can join up with like-minded souls. That's right. Um, very quickly, Yarden has emailed back from Israel. Ah. She says no, not brown for voices. Blue. Ah, so she has blue. Okay. No brown, mm. she says at all. Interesting. Oh, how fascinating. Everybody's different. They're Nancy, all different. Nancy, friend, thank you so much. Thanks for having and me. And enjoy in. your time over here in London, because I know you're not here for, for long. Thank so you. Thank you. And the book is called Rapeseed. 4.30, time now for the news.